Patriotism is a universal human emotion. We find it in every nation on earth, even nationalities that have no sovereign state of their own, such as the Kurds in the Middle East or the various American Indian tribes in our own country. We find it among immigrants, even though they've made a conscious choice to leave their homeland. Their actions reveal that they have found their own countries lacking and this foreign land superior, but that doesn't mean that they have to admit that the people and the culture that they find here are also superior or even as good. Everyone likes to think that the language he already speaks is the most beautiful or the most precise or the most subtle or the most useful language on earth. Everyone likes to think that the customs of his home country or his hometown are at least as sensible and proper as those anywhere else, and that the heroes of his own people's past are at least the equals of anybody else's heroes. It's a potent beverage, patriotism, mixed, brewed from a mixture of some good elements, such as love of family, and some bad elements, such as egoism and prejudice. But mostly we think of it as a good thing because of the way that it tempers outright selfishness, encouraging us to open ourselves to our countrymen and include them in a broad we instead of a narrow and self-focused I. And in our country, at least, patriotism has the interesting trait of being explicitly multi-ethnic, thanks to all the waves of immigration that have populated here. One of the things that we're proudest about as Americans is that we have a melting pot into which many national strains have been combined and out of which we can take the best elements each has to offer. Even in our current postmodern situation where we celebrate the lumps in the fondue more than we do the smooth and blended parts, our emphasis is still on the idea that diversity makes the nation as a whole more interesting, stronger, better. Like the man who is proud of his own humility, we are patriotic about the way that we have transcended traditional ethnocentric patriotism. And we get a lot of encouragement from the rest of the world in our appraisal of our own country. Immigration policy may be a thorny political issue, but we're flattered that so many people want to join us here. No, we're past being flattered. We assume that they want to get in. This is the place to be. We're used to being among the world leaders, if not the world leader, in technology, in higher education, in trade, medicine, military strength, diplomatic influence, political stability, and on and on, and I could go on. Cultural pride might be hard to objectively maintain for a nation that's just been quickly conquered by a neighboring nation, or for a refugee who is forced to reconcile his love of country with the fact that he can't survive there anymore, that it can't protect him, that maybe it's trying to kill him. But it's not hard for us. In one of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books, a famously conceited character named Zaphod Beeblebrox is subjected by his enemies to a machine called the Total Perspective Vortex, which is supposed to destroy people's minds by showing them the vast reaches of the cosmos and then that individual himself in relation to all of it so he can really appreciate how insignificant he is. But when Zaphod comes out, he's just as cocky as ever because for reasons I can't go into right now, the machine has shown him exactly what he expected to see, that he was in fact the center of the universe and the most important person in it. That's kind of what it's been like to be an American in the past couple generations. If we didn't know that we were reading the word of God this morning, if we didn't have that very good reason for humility, we would hear our Old Testament reading just as another example of this universal impulse to patriotism. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? We would smile patronizingly down the corridors of history and say, that's right, Israel, believe in yourselves. You go get them, Israel. Because we like it when ethnic groups stick up for themselves and make interesting music and open exotic restaurants. 
And if we've studied some history, we know that this particular nation, Israel, actually did play a very important part in the development of Western civilization, and hence in our own story. So we wouldn't just be patronizing them, we would also feel some real respect for how advanced they were by ancient standards. But we wouldn't count ourselves or our own great nation among the ones that would stand and gaze in awe upon Israel's wise law and would say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Maybe great and wise compared to the Canaanites or the Edomites or the Moabites. Maybe the Egyptians too, but not compared to us. We've come a long way since then. We've built on their achievements. Our law is quite a bit more sophisticated, it takes a lot more into account. We think it's wiser and it's juster. Not to brag, it just is. Not to brag, right? But you can't help bragging when you're pretty sure that you're the best. And the tricky thing about this is, in many ways, the law that God gave to Israel was tailored for a specific time and place. It was designed as much to keep them separate from the Gentiles and to teach them about the coming Christ as it was to promote justice and righteousness. There are parts of it that were designed to pass away. So we have in our gospel reading today an example of Jesus himself teaching this, going beyond the law of Moses, declaring all foods clean, which was a contravention of that law, and teaching what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, etc. But the key to the proper evaluation of the Old Testament law is to approach it not as a relatively impressive but ultimately primitive example of human jurisprudence, but as what it claims to be, the law of God himself, delivered to Israel through his prophet Moses. We can't do it justice if we approach it with modern arrogance. The only way to approach it is through Jesus Christ, through his teaching on the subject, as found in passages such as today's gospel reading, and through the work that he himself did in fulfilling it for us and freeing us from its curse. When we read this passage from Deuteronomy, we can't read it just as 21st century Americans. We can't read it even mostly as 21st century Americans. We need to read it as Christians, as members of the church, and hence, citizens of Israel. When Moses urged that multitude of escaped slaves to keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you, in order that they might be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. When he said that to the Israelites, the Spirit of God through him was speaking to us too. For what great nation is there that has a God so near it as the Lord our God is to us, that is, to his church, whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Who else but the church enjoys the constant presence of God in his indwelling spirit and his word, and even through the very body and blood that that word took for our salvation. And who else but the church acknowledges the law of God as it was taught by Moses and as it was taught and fulfilled by Jesus Christ. We have dual citizenship. We're not just Americans. We are also the Israel of God. And this citizenship that second one is far more important because the United States has impressive holdings in this world, but it has no territory at all in the world that is to come. But there is a Jerusalem above. As St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4 and St. John in Revelation chapter 21, our citizenship is in heaven, Paul writes in Philippians. And so like old Israel, we should feel a kind of patriotism and excitement at the thought that when we keep and do the law of God and his law comes in this way to the attention of the Gentiles, they may say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And I call this patriotism as distinct from individual pride because as we see in the text, your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples consists in the statutes of God himself 
the statutes themselves, the fact that your nation is governed by such a wise law as the Ten Commandments and not in your own individual prowess when it comes to fulfilling them. Now, obviously, the effect is heightened. The Gentiles can be more favorably impressed when they see the people of God actually living according to the law that they attribute to the Almighty. But if we were able to toe the line in every commandment perfectly, as far as visible behavior was concerned, but we're made proud by this achievement, if our actions were blameless, but we stopped believing that we were really sinners, we would lose sympathy with the world. We would not be able to love our neighbors. And as love is the fulfilling of the law, all that would be left for us would be the pomp of the Pharisees, an impressive show on the outside, but within being filled with dead man's bones. The true, deep and awe-inspiring wisdom and understanding of this great nation, the church, lies in the way that Jesus has taught and fulfilled its divine law. For he has taught it as a matter of the heart, which no one can obey who does not love the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and soul and his neighbor as himself. And second, he has himself accomplished that feat and every good work that it entails in his life here on this earth. And then, despite his perfection, he gave himself over to the penalty of death for your sake and for my sake and for the sake of all the Gentiles, everyone who loves himself more than God and loves himself more than his neighbor. In order that the citizens of his kingdom might never look down their self-righteous noses at those sinners, but might acknowledge their own sin as well. And yet, despite acknowledging their own status, might love this wise and divine law and hold it up for emulation and strive to live that way themselves, knowing that although it accuses them on many points, it cannot condemn them, it cannot slay them, it cannot doom them to hell because Jesus Christ was condemned in their place. This is the way to live before the Gentiles. Now, mind you, it doesn't mean that if we're faithful to our Christian confession, the Gentiles will all admire us as a wise and understanding people. They have their own patriotisms too, and they conflict radically with ours. In a secular sphere, an immigrant can embrace the new land while still holding a great deal of fondness and pride with regard to the old. Old and new can be blended, but in the spiritual sphere, this cannot be done. To become a citizen of the new Jerusalem is to condemn your past life in its entirety. To renounce the devil with all his works and all his ways and to recognize that your past works and ways inherited from your father Abraham were the devils, even the ones you were proudest of. So the Gentiles have many reasons to reject our message and many available methods by which to do so. They will focus on the Christians who show the world the greatest self-righteousness, the least love, the most shameful hypocrisy. Being secure in their own virtue, they will call the life-giving gospel a cloak for evil. They will call it a miscarriage of justice. They'll call it an illusion for bad people who want to consider themselves good. Being wise in their own conceit, they will scoff at God's law when it diverges from the current wisdom. Instead of recognizing its goodness and reasonableness and its indispensable value as a light and blessed guide to sinners trying to navigate the pitfalls of a fallen world. Many of them will conclude the opposite of what we hear in our Old Testament reading and say, this great nation is a foolish and an ignorant people. But let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be wise and every man a sinful, self-interested fool, interested in nothing more than justifying himself. Let your patriotism be undiminished 
your love for the law and the gospel, your confidence that God will still work through his church to convince many who are outside, many who now are scoffers, that this is indeed a wise and understanding people. Not because of our own wisdom or our own understanding, but because of the divine teachings that we have learned and hold in our hearts. And he will work through his church also to continue to convince you and me that there is no other nation that has statutes and rules so righteous, nor a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. In the name of Jesus, amen.